Greetings, my name is Barry Setterfield. Welcome to this session. A quiet revolution has been taking place in astronomy just recently. For the last 300 years or so, astronomers have been explaining everything that we see out there in terms of gravity and gravitational interactions. Now, gravity is a slow process, and astronomers therefore are used to talking in terms of millions and billions of years. However, just recently it's been realised that over 99% of the universe that we see is in the form of plasma. And plasma interactions are electric and magnetic. If electric and magnetic processes form the universe, they are much faster acting than gravity. So we need to examine this in detail. So let's start our exploration of how all of this fits in with the Bible. After a presentation of the role of plasma in astronomy, a professor of astronomy in Southern Oregon stated, quote, It is exciting science based on repeatable lab experiments and opens up new answers to old problems, end quote. Indeed, a well-known astronomer, Halton Arp, who had a catalogue of galaxies named after him, stated that, quote, The study of electrified plasma is the future of astrophysics, end quote. Other astronomers like these can see the possibilities that this study opens up. Some of those possibilities are presented here. A chart is available which gives a summary of this session. Like the chart, we concentrate on four aspects of plasma astronomy and the Bible, and related matters. This makes it convenient to stop and discuss these topics with the class if need be. The class should therefore have a copy of the chart before them. We start with the first panel, what is plasma? Have you ever played with a plasma ball from a toy shop? The way the plasma filaments twist and turn is fascinating, but such a simple toy has much to teach astronomers about the universe and the way galaxies, stars and planets are made. But first of all, what is the plasma we see in the ball or out in space? You may be familiar with the three states of matter, solid, liquid and gas. In a solid, molecules are held tightly together by the chemical bonds between them, as in ice. In a liquid, like water, molecules are more weakly bound. They have more freedom to move, but are still attached. In a gas, like steam, molecules are not bound at all, but move freely wherever they please. Then there is the fourth state of matter, plasma in which the very atoms themselves are disrupted into their separate parts. A typical atom is on the left. It is made up of a nucleus of positively charged protons and some neutral neutrons. That positively charged nucleus is surrounded by circling electrons which are negatively charged. The entire atom itself, protons, neutrons and electrons, is thus electrically neutral but a high energy disrupts the atom into its component parts, as we see on the right, leaving electrons and protons to wander on their own as plasma. From this slide, it is apparent that atoms have a formal structure, as on the left, but plasma, as in the right-hand image, does not. This raises an interesting point. Genesis 1.1 says that in the beginning, time, God created... Bara, literal Hebrew, out of nothing, the heavens, space, and the earth, erects in Hebrew, which means that which is firm, or more basically, matter. So God created out of nothing, space, matter, and time. Verse 2 then tells us that, quote, matter was formless and vacuous, end quote. A round rotating planet or a star has a form. So too does an atom. So planets, stars and atoms, as depicted on the left, were not what God created out of nothing. The only formless and vacuous state of matter is space plasma, as shown on the right. So it would seem that God created matter in the plasma state and formed the universe, the galaxies, stars and planets from there. It is no wonder that scientists claim that over 99% of the universe exists as plasma. 
Indeed, in 2009, a statement was made by Lawrence Berkeley National Labs that, quote, for some time after the Big Bang, the universe was so hot that all matter existed as plasma, end quote. Even today, after stars and planets have formed, 99.9% of matter in the cosmos is still in the plasma state. We move on to the next panel on the plasma chart. Here are some examples of plasma. Neon signs are glowing plasma. So are flames. The nebulas we see out in space are matter in a plasma state. The solar wind, the stream of charged particles from the sun which fills the entire solar system, is plasma. The aurora borealis is glowing plasma, while lightning and the sun's surface are both high-energy or arc-mode plasmas. Auroras are plasma sheets and filaments. Since 1973, when measurements from spacecraft were first made, it was found that currents ranging from 650,000 up to 1 million amperes were flowing in auroras. The right image of the aurora is from above Alberta, Canada, and was taken from the International Space Station, the ISS. The ISS also took the bottom image above Alaska. Plasmas are made up of charged particles, sometimes called ions. Charged particles in motion is the definition of an electric current, so plasmas usually have electric currents associated with them. One key thing to remember is that all electric currents, I on this chart, have circling magnetic fields, B, which obey the right-hand rule. If the thumb points in the current direction, the fingers curl in the magnetic field direction. So plasma currents are constrained by their circling magnetic fields. Therefore, plasmas typically form filaments and sheets. This can be seen in examples ranging from nebulas out in space, like the Veil Nebula on the left, or the many filamented tarantula nebula in the centre, or the plasma ball on Earth on the bottom right. These are relatively small-scale examples. Filaments are ubiquitous throughout the cosmos. However, on larger scales, we can see plasma filaments making up the spiral arms of galaxies. This is an infrared false colour image of the galaxy M81, which brings out the structure of spiral arms well. Close inspection reveals that the arms themselves are made up of filaments with the stars, the white spots, being like beads on a string. That is an important detail. In plasma physics, stars form on filaments with their spin axes lined up. In 2010, analysis of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey data also proved it was true for galaxies, as sketched here. All galaxies examined have their spin axes lined up along filaments. The results stunned many astronomers, as it's impossible according to the usual gravitational model of galaxy formation. But a cross-check confirmed the result which accords with plasma physics. On a larger scale again, plots of galaxy positions were made like this one from the Tartu Observatory in Estonia. We are in the bottom left-hand corner. The plot goes out to a considerable distance and convinced scientists that the distribution of galaxies was basically filamentary. Computer modelling under gravity and the effects of dark matter can only reproduce this result if everything is extremely fine-tuned. The plasma option therefore accounts for this distribution naturally, without special conditions at all, and so it's to be preferred. On the 20th of November 2014, gravitational astronomers were shocked again. Professor Hatsumikas and his team plotted the positions and orientations of 93 very distant quasars, as shown here. Quasars are galaxies with ultra-brilliant centres and spin-axis jets, as in the example at the bottom left. They reported, and I quote, The first odd thing we noticed was that these quasars' rotation axes and jets were aligned with each other along the filaments, despite the fact that they were separated by billions of light-years. 
end quote. This accords with plasma physics, but cannot occur gravitationally. And then at the very frontiers of the universe, there is the most distant item that can be observed. It is sometimes called the echo of the Big Bang. As we look back in time, we come to this bank of plasma fog that hides all that happened earlier. It is called the Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation, or CMBR for short. It is shown here mainly in green. It records the moment when neutral atoms were forming out of the plasma fog and so were marking the positions of the developing filaments from which the galaxies were formed. Here are two images of the CMBR, the bottom right image being a more detailed version of the other. Red areas are warmer and blue areas cooler. The large-scale pattern of the filaments has been shown to correspond to the distribution of filaments in the present cosmos. So the presence of filaments is ubiquitous throughout the universe and through time. But there is a final aspect of these diagrams which cause surprise. As you analyse the patterns of the hot and cold spots in the CMBR, not only are they filamentary, but they also have the same structure as sound waves. Professor Paolo Di Bernardis of the Sapienza University in Rome, leader of the team doing the analysis, said, and I quote, The early universe is full of sound waves compressing and rarefying the plasma, much like sound waves compress and rarefy air inside a flute or trumpet. For the first time, the new data clearly show the harmonics of these waves, end quote. Science has shown that sound waves in plasma was 57% of the speed of light under these origin conditions of the CMBR. The study found that the volume of sound was at 110 decibels, the same as a rock concert. So these incredibly fast and loud sound waves were concentrating the plasma into filaments and voids in the same way that air inside a flute or trumpet is compressed and rarefied. This is simply illustrated here by the two vibrating tuning forks. In the same way that sound waves from tuning forks compress and rarefy the molecules of air to transmit sound, so also the sound waves in the early universe compress and rarefy plasma particles into filaments and voids. The louder the sound, the greater the compression and the more well-defined the filaments will be. At the same boomerang conference where these results were announced, Professor Andrew Langer of Caltech said, quote, Using a music analogy, we could tell what notes we were seeing. We see not just one, but three of these peaks, and can tell not only which note is being played, but also what instrument is playing it. We can begin to hear, in detail, the music of creation, end quote. Those three peaks are shown here. The intervals between them show the notes involved are A, F-sharp and C-sharp, that is, an F-sharp minor chord. But it is being sounded at some 50 octaves below middle C, an incredibly deep bass to reverberate through the massive universe. Science does not know the origin of these sound waves. They propose a system of black holes. Instead, it is possible that it is God's voice. Psalm 33.9 says, and I quote, God spoke, and it was made. He commanded, and it stood firm, end quote. So origin data show that sound waves made the pattern of the first plasma filaments from which the galaxies formed. With this background, let us look at three more things using the plasma approach. First, star formation, second, galaxy formation, and third, how long all this took. All time issues will be discussed later when we're discussing this third item. Standard astronomy based on gravitation has problems with all three items. Plasma physics does not have those problems. So let us begin with star formation. In order to form stars, 
Standard astronomy proposes that a gas and dust cloud collapses under its own gravity. It then forms a central object, a star or a sun, with a spinning disk of material around it. The sun lights up and the disk eventually forms planets as particles collide to build up larger and larger bodies. One problem is shown on the right. As a gas and dust cloud collapses under gravity, it heats up. This heating re-expands the cloud, thereby stopping collapse from forming a concentrated body. Science tries to overcome this problem a number of ways, but other difficulties arise. Yet even the most optimistic estimate gives a formation time for stars of about one million years. Some suggest the time is much longer. The formation of stars on plasma filaments is very different. It can be done in the lab. There, in the lab, any instability in temperature or flow of current in a plasma filament causes the circling magnetic field to pinch the plasma. This is called a Bennett pinch or Z pinch, as illustrated here. When the plasma is pinched like this, it forms a ball called a plasmoid. In the lab, the ball forms at the plasma pinch in 40 to 200 billionths of a second, or roughly 100 nanoseconds. In the lab, this pinching concentrates the electric current and the ball goes into arc mode. In arc mode, all plasmas have the same basic characteristics. They may be like an arc welder's torch, as on the left, or a lightning bolt seen in the centre, or the surface of the sun on the right. In fact, the surface of most stars are arc mode plasmas in their brilliance, no matter what is happening deeper down. Here are two examples from space of plasma filaments pinching in and concentrating the material into a plasmoid ball. The arc mode current then lights up the ball as a star. It does this without the problems of gravitational collapse. The image on the left is called the ant nebula, while the one on the right is the butterfly nebula. In this example, the M29 nebula shows the filament, the pinch, the arc mode star, and evidence of action of polar jets, which we see with plasmoids in the lab as well, as shown in the bottom right image. It proves that star making is a typical plasma phenomena, but all these are only isolated examples. For many stars to form at once, let us go to the region of the sky with a star group called Orion. In August 2014, the Green Bank Telescope discovered a 10 light year long filamentary structure in Orion which was forming stars, as well as pebbles half an inch across. Their image is on the left. The optical telescopes got to work and produced the image on the right, where the filament complex moves diagonally to the top right. Every white dot on that complex is a young star. Another filament in Orion with stars forming was imaged by two different space-based cameras on the left and on the right, and combined in the centre. The study concluded on the 16th of May 2016, quote, Stars were formed by magnetic processes acting on filaments, end quote. So a few astronomers are coming to accept the new plasma approach. Indeed, as plasma astronomers have found, stars can form on filaments, quote, like beads on a string, end quote, via the Z pinches. The star cluster M35 in Gemini, shown here, has over 500 stars in streams from the filament origin process. See if you can trace the streams or strings of beads that the stars show from their plasma origin on this image. As far as stars are concerned, two different types or classes or populations of stars have been noted. This is apparent from the appearance of many spiral galaxies, like M31, the great galaxy in Andromeda shown here. Note the colour distribution. The core and hub of the galaxy has an overall red-orange-yellow hue, while the spiral arms are mainly blue. Closer examination reveals that the central regions have many cool red giant stars that tint their environment accordingly. Alternately, 
In the spiral arms, the giants are blue and hot, not red and cool. So we seem to have two different populations of stars. This is a classic diagram of the situation. Here we are looking at a spiral galaxy side on, with the central hub prominent and the spiral arms shown as a thin band on either side of the hub. From here it can be seen that the hot blue giants and stars in the spiral arms generally are population one stars. Alternately, the stars in the hub and halo around the centre of the galaxy are population two, whose brightest representatives are the cool red giants. Gravitational astronomy has many assumptions to account for this difference, but in plasma physics from lab experiments, hub stars of population two form first and are sometimes called the old stars. Then later, the population one or young stars formed at the same time as the spiral arms developed. Here is a sketch of our own Milky Way galaxy as determined by extensive observations. There may be some errors, but our galaxy basically looks like this. The Sun is near the position marked by the yellow star. Obviously, it is in the spiral arms, and so is part of population one. Consequently, it is a young star, as are all the stars in our vicinity, which give light upon the Earth, as Genesis 1.15 expresses it. But in plasma physics, the hubs of each galaxy form first, with the population two stars, the old stars. These first stars must be the morning stars, those that shone out on the first morning of creation week, as recorded in Job 38.7. Some feel these stars were angels, but the oldest version of the scriptures translated from the original Paleo-Hebrew makes the difference clear. There in the Septuagint version it reads, quote, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth, when the morning stars were made, and all my angels praised me with a loud voice? End quote. So the Lord clearly states to Job that the first stars were shining when the earth's foundation was laid. This means that the population of stars, which includes the sun, came afterwards and so were younger than the earliest stars. There are more details shortly, but here the Bible is testifying to an astronomical truth that there are two main types of star, the old or population two stars, and the young or population one stars, like our sun. Let us now move on to consider galaxies and their formation. Gravitational astronomy has serious timing problems with galaxy formation and other associated data that they cannot explain satisfactorily. We have seen how stars formed on filaments, but how about galaxies? A filamentary structure for the universe was predicted by plasma physics pioneer Hannes Alphen in 1963, shown on the left. The prediction was proven correct in 1991, when the positions of nearby galaxies were plotted, resulting in the diagram on the right. Every dot is the position of a galaxy. We are near the centre. This result came as a shock to standard astronomers. Computer modelling using gravity and dark matter need very special conditions to get this result, but the plasma option accounts for this distribution easily without special conditions. On the 10th of March 2014, a discovery made galaxy problems worse on the gravitational model. An official research report from Swinburne University of Technology, Melbourne, Australia, was headlined, Galaxies in the Early Universe Mature Beyond Their Years. The report read, and I quote, The mature galaxies with about 100 billion stars were found at a record-breaking distance of 12 billion light-years, seen when the universe was just 1.6 billion years old. The existence of mature galaxies at such an early time raises new questions. Fifteen years ago they were predicted not to even exist. End quote. The problem is that, gravitationally, galaxies take at least one billion years to form in five stages. First, 
bodies of gas, dust and early stars collide. Second, the stars begin to rotate around their common centre of mass. Third, the rotation collapses the cloud to form a galactic disk. Fourth, the motion created by the spinning disk causes the spiral arms to form. And then fifth, the stars form within the spiral arms. These finally mature galaxies had nowhere near enough time to fully develop gravitationally after the origin of the cosmos. Yet there they are, a huge problem. That problem became much worse in December 2020. The most distant galaxy had just been found, GNZ11, which is 13.4 billion light years away. The science journals reporting this commented that this is only 420 million years after the Big Bang. The data indicate that, quote, the galaxy is remarkably and unexpectedly luminous at such an early time. With a mass of over one billion stars there, this challenges our understanding of early galaxy build-up. So the huge problem gets worse. However, plasma physics has an entirely different approach, which avoids all these problems. Meet Anthony L. Peratt, Senior Staff Member, Los Alamos National Laboratories. His lab experiments gave us the basis for understanding how plasma physics fits in with the observational data for galaxy formation. To begin, the image on the left is a photograph of plasma filaments in an experimental tube. Note that about a dozen different filaments on the left sector are being attracted to each other. The reason why can be demonstrated by two parallel wires with electric currents which go in the same direction, as shown on the right. When currents in wires or plasma filaments are in the same direction, the wires or filaments attract each other. This happens because the circling magnetic fields reinforce. If the electric currents were in opposite directions, the filaments, wires and magnetic fields would repel. Here is a sketch of plasma filaments interacting in space. Where the filaments are more or less parallel, they will be attracted. At the closest point of interaction, the shape of the plasma changes to become a thin disk. As the interaction continues, the shape of the disk evolves to the bottom left, figure for the plasma itself, and to the top right for the magnetic fields. Peratt's lab experiments detail the interaction sequence of plasma filaments carrying currents in the same direction. Here we are looking down the long axis of two filaments in a cross-section at the closest point of approach. At that point, the filament interactions cause the plasma to become shaped like a thin disk and a miniature galaxy forms. This series shows that only two interacting filaments were employed in this case. However, it was demonstrated that the full range of galaxy types can come from two or three interacting filaments, even though as many as 12 were used in the full series of experiments. The lab results show that spiral arms break up into stars from Z-pinch instabilities, like beads on a string, as Peratt stated. Several stages in the development of a galaxy from plasma filaments are important. As the two or three filaments approach each other, the plasma between them becomes concentrated by the magnetic field. This is shown in the left sequence from top to bottom, where the magnetic field lines come closer and closer together and concentrated at the centre. At this point, both in the lab and in space, the equivalent of a quasar and its jets forms. Quasars are ultra-brilliant galaxy centres with polar jets. They are often so bright that the galaxy around them cannot be seen. The right-hand image of a quasar and jet comes from the European Southern Observatory. The centres of all distant galaxies show these incredibly bright quasars as this image of a quasar, jets and galaxy core portrays. These prominent particle jets also form in the lab. They come from a concentrated ball of plasma and highly compressed electric and magnetic fields in and around the ball or plasmoid. This is shown in the lower left. 
In Peratt's experiments, each step in the development of a galaxy was time-coded. A quasar, jets and galaxy core had developed by T equals 300. Each T step was equivalent to one ten thousandth of a second experimentally. After quasars, stars in the core of galaxies and in the halo around the hub then develop. The sketch shows the position of these objects in relation to our galaxy. On the right is a photograph of the globular cluster M13 in the halo above the hub of our galaxy. These stars are some of the old or population 2 stars, which Job 38 referred to as morning stars. These had formed by time code T equals 600 experimentally. As the interaction continues, the equivalent of a barred spiral galaxy forms in the lab, the first two frames on the top left. One example from space is NGC 1300 on the lower left. Finally, a full spiral galaxy appears and population 1 stars start shining in the filaments like beads on strings. Lower right are the blue giant population 1 stars of the Pleiades cluster, easily visible to the naked eye in the northern winter. The whole sequence in the lab forms these miniature galaxies in one fourth of a second or less. The published time codes are as follows. Quasars and polar jets active by T equals 300. Population 2 stars in the core and hub are shining by T equals 600. Population 1 stars in spiral arms by T equals 1750 to T equals 2500. A full galaxy complete by time code T equals 2500 where T is one ten thousandth of a second. So T equals 2500 equals 0.25 equals one quarter of a second. A new possibility now opens up. Plasma filaments behave in the same way regardless of size, so their behaviour in the lab is the same as out in space. The only difference is the scale factor. Plasma physics shows this factor is a linear one, or simple size for size. As a result, a conversion factor can be applied to upscale the lab results to objects out in the universe. In his write-up of the experimental results, Peratt supplied that conversion factor to upscale the lab results to the size of real cosmic objects. It is 5.87 by 10 to the 11th, with the answer being given in seconds. But we can go further, as all these results require the present electric and magnetic properties of the vacuum to be maintained over time. Yet these very properties depend on the strength of something called the vacuum zero-point energy, or ZPE. The key point is that the ZPE strength itself changed as the cosmos expanded. So, as the universe expanded and the ZPE strength changed, so too did the electric and magnetic properties of the vacuum, and with them, the speed of plasma processes. Thus we need to briefly look at the outcome of cosmic expansion and see these effects. Then we need to determine the actual quantity by which the ZPE has changed and plasma interactions with it. The data we need comes from the effect of the ZPE on subatomic particles, specifically electrons. Observation gives this ZPE correction factor. When it is coupled with Peratt's conversion factor, then the complete answer emerges as to how fast the plasma processes were originally. Let us look at these items in more detail, beginning with the expansion or stretching of space. The Bible states 12 times that God created the heavens and stretched them out. These passages in Isaiah are typical. Isaiah 42.5 says, Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out. Isaiah 44.24 I am the Lord, who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens alone. Isaiah 45.12 My hand stretched out the heavens, and all their host I have ordered. 
Isaiah 51.13, your maker who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. Science agrees that the heavens were indeed stretched out after the singularity at the beginning, the bottom left. As the fabric of space was stretched out, the galaxies became farther apart, as in the top left and top right diagrams. The stretching of the heavens was like inflating a balloon, bottom right. As the stretching went on, the energy in the fabric of the balloon built up. An expanded rubber band also has energy in its fabric. Likewise, space expanded has energy in its fabric too. As the expansion went on, the energy built up. Space is thought to be made up of a fabric or structure. As space expands, energy goes into this fabric. One proposal for the fabric of space is shown in the bottom right. This suggests that the weave of the fabric is made up of extremely tiny shapes of other dimensions. The energy in space appears as the zero-point energy, the ZPE. How do we know it's there, and what is the form of this energy? So let us take a perfectly sealable flask and pump all solids, liquids and gases out of it. Once all this matter and all atoms and ions have been removed, it is often assumed that there is then a perfect vacuum within the flask. But it was discovered that this vacuum still contains and transmits heat radiation. So let us cool the flask down to zero degrees Kelvin, that is absolute zero, or about minus 460 degrees Fahrenheit, that is minus 273 degrees Celsius. When we do this, the result is called a bare vacuum. However, in the early 20th century, theory and experiment both revealed that there was an energy there, intrinsic to the vacuum. Because that energy exists even at absolute zero temperature in an actual vacuum, it has been called the zero-point energy. The real vacuum in which this exists is called the physical vacuum. We are not aware of the presence of the all-pervasive zero-point energy, ZPE. For the same reason, we are not aware of the 14 pounds per square inch of atmospheric pressure on our bodies. It is balanced inside and out. The ZPE exists inside all our measuring devices. It is only once the quantity goes above the ZPE background level that it registers on our instruments. The ZPE comprises electromagnetic waves of all wavelengths. It has many more short wavelengths than long ones, so atoms are seriously jiggled around, while our home furniture is not. The ZPE exists as random, or stochastic, interacting waves. The study of these random waves and ZPE effects is SED physics, which stands for Stochastic Electrodynamics. However, there is a twofold aspect to the ZPE waves. Let us introduce it this way. When ocean waves meet, they crest and form white caps, which soon disappear and return to ocean waves. When energy waves of the ZPE meet, the concentration of energy forms particle pairs, positive and negative, which soon slam back together, annihilate and return to energy. So the ZPE can be considered either from a wave or a particle approach. In fact, there is a whole zoo of virtual particles of all types. The virtual particle pairs, VP, are positively and negatively charged. As a result, along with the ZPE waves, they control the electric and magnetic properties of the vacuum of space. At any instant today, there are about 10 to the 58 virtual particles per cubic inch. So as cosmic expansion continued, the ZPE increased. Space then got thicker with energy and virtual particles. So an increase in, N in ZPE changes the electric and magnetic properties of space. This has a number of trails which lead to interesting conclusions, but for our purposes here, we need to know how much the ZPE has increased since the origin of the cosmos. We get this information from subatomic particles, like electrons. Here are two pictures of the behaviour of electrons. 
the one on the left was what was expected historically. However, the one on the right is what we found actually occurred. Because of the extremely high numbers of very short wavelength ZPE waves, all atomic particles undergo intense battering by the ZPE. Electrons are hit by the impacting ZPE waves and so jitter back and forth 10 to the 20th times per second. The question might be, how can we measure such a fast jitter? Here is the simplest possible explanation. Electrons scatter incoming light at the same frequency as their jitter. As shown here, incoming light has all the colours of the rainbow. However, jittering electrons will scatter that light, but in a special way. The light that is scattered will have the same frequency as the jitter. So we can measure the frequency and or wavelength or colour of that scattered light, shown green here. This gives us the jitter frequency. This is also called the Compton frequency and is the same as the number of hits per second by the ZPE waves. This sketch shows the pervasive ZPE waves hit the electron at the Compton frequency, C star. But it is true that the ZPE strength is equal to the square root of C star over 4 pi. This tells us that the ZPE is 3.13 by 10 to the 9 higher now than at the origin when the stretching of space had just begun. Since the higher the ZPE, the slower the electric and magnetic processes will be, we divide by this factor in Pratt's plasma equations. The following information then emerges. T is a time-coded step to form the lab filament objects in experiments. T times 5.87 by 10 to the 11 seconds is the universe formation time of the same type of object as Peratt's upscaling today. Z equals 3.13 by 10 to the 9 is the ZPE change factor from creation to now. When we put this all together, the time to form the same object at creation by plasma processes as in the lab is T times 187.5 seconds. The following information then emerges. The first quasars lit up galaxies about 12.5 hours after the origin of the cosmos. Genesis 1.5 says the first light shone out about 12 hours after the initial creation. Stars in galaxy cores were all shining 24 hours after the origin. Job 38.7 says the first or morning stars were all shining in the morning of the first day, that is 12 to 24 hours after the origin. Spiral arm stars in galaxies lit up from 3.1 to 4.3 days after the origin. Genesis 1.14 says that the sun and stars in our region had lit up by the end of day four. This means that the Genesis account of creation is true, and the galaxies had all formed by the end of day four in creation week. However, if this is correct, many astronomers point out the glaring problem that they have if the universe is less than 10,000 years old. As shown here, the circle around the sun is 6,000 light years across. This is the distance that light at its present speed has travelled in 6,000 years. We should not be able to see much farther than this, but the Andromeda galaxy is 2 million light years away from us, and the Virgo cluster is 60 million light years away, and the most distant galaxy is 12.6 billion light years away. The problem is that light travelling at its present speed could only penetrate to about 10,000 light years distance since creation. Yet we can see all of these galaxies. How is that possible? The answer is that light is also an electromagnetic entity. As such, it is affected by the ZPE and all the virtual particles in the vacuum it has to negotiate on its journey. But back when the universe started there were almost no virtual particles. However, 
the fact that the zero-point energy has increased by a factor of 3.13 by 10 to the 9 since then means that the speed of light was initially that much faster than now as well. The reason is the expansion of space. As the stretching of the cosmos went on, more and more energy was invested in space, so the ZPB built up and space got thicker with virtual particles as their numbers in a given volume increased. In the early cosmos, as shown on the left, only a few virtual particles existed to slow the light photons in transit by absorption and re-emission. Later, on the middle and on the right, increasing particle numbers slowed light photons significantly. While they exist, virtual particle pairs, underlined in red on the left, are able to absorb a travelling photon of light, the blue arrow on the left. However, the moment they slam back together, that photon is re-emitted and goes on its way until it hits another virtual particle. So the progress of light through space is like a runner going over hurdles. The more hurdles to jump, the longer the run time in the race. The more virtual particles in its path, the longer it takes the photon to travel the distance to the observer. As a result, it can be stated that at creation, with almost no stretching or expansion, the speed of light was just over 3 billion times faster than now. Light reached Earth from the quasar at the centre of our galaxy in 3.7 minutes. The whole extent of our galaxy was illuminated in less than 15 minutes by that quasar. This is in line with Genesis 1, 2-4. Finally, light from the most distant parts of the cosmos have reached us in less than 10,000 years. So it seems that the Bible might be right scientifically after all. And it's apparent that just one new fact, which had been unappreciated up to this point in time, can totally change the outlook in science. We hope that this session has helped you understand science and the Bible a bit more perfectly, and we trust that it brings you into a deeper relationship with the Lord and a trust in his word. Thank you very much for your time.